two more and and we got people jumping in the waiting room. So, and I know Ron needs to leave, but we're going to give everybody about two minutes. Oh, no, I know. I got time. I, I'm not going to run, run off until it's time. Have our entertainment come back for a few minutes. <laughs> Hey everybody, how are we doing? It's hey. Deanna. Hey Deanna. Hey Deanna. I thought y'all'd be all in Chicago. That was Cindy. Yeah, that was Cindy. Cindy. You in Chicago, baby? Yep, just got back late last night. Oh, you're home already. Oh wow, okay. Mm -hmm. Party's over. Get to work. I know, yeah. right? Hey Evelyn. Howdy. <laughs> I feel like I feel like Gomer says, hey. <laughs> she I work sounds like she's from you, our you part know. of the world. <laughs> I'm drinking coffee on the porch, sweating to death, but trying to stay awake. I've been up since three o'clock. Oh, my oh, word. word. Oh. I didn't know people in New Orleans used howdy. <laughs> <laughs> We're whiners. W-I-N-E-R. Oh, that's it. We'll have to see if we can come up with a way to uh, send wine at the end of the year. Last year, we did door prizes. The first year, we did do wine. Yeah, so. we did have a cocktail hour the first time you did this. Yep. That's why I keep coming back. <laughs> we might just have to have bring your own cocktail in December. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I don't like to drink by myself. Oh, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have 3.33 and we have 53 people on. Insurance must be important to a lot of people, especially New Orleans. New Orleans had 58 people sign up for the call. Y'all won the prize, Evelyn. And none of us have insurance. <laughs> There's no companies left for writing down here. <laughs> Tony, do you want to do a quick welcome or you want to save your comments for the end? Save it to the end. All right, well, we're going to get started right off the bat with insurance, property yes. insurance in Louisiana. And we have Ron Henderson, who is the Deputy Commissioner with the Office of Consumer Advocacy and Diversity for the Louisiana Department of Insurance. He has over 23 years of work experience in the industry and uh, has proven to be successful in that. He's placing an emphasis on insurance compliance and governmental regulations along with consumer education, which is why he's here today. He is a 1999 graduate of Southern Law Center and was admitted to the practice of law in April of 2000. And with that, Ron, I am turning it all over to you. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, went to law school because couldn't count. <laughs> it's much easier to read stuff. But look, we're, we, uh, we are in a very trying time right now. Our, our, um, as most of you know, especially my, my people in New Orleans, GNO area, uh, insurance is very hard to come by. Uh, where we are now, so we lost nine companies to insolvency, which is a bankruptcy uh, receivership here in Louisiana. Uh, after the four hurricanes, the, the bookends, Laura and Ida, Ida being the worst of them, uh, really took a toll on the companies. And then thereafter, those nine companies, five of which were from Florida, got hit by in, which really exacerbated the problem. Um, so we had five from, from um, Florida that went under. We had three from Louisiana and one from DC, Washington, DC. That coupled along with about 12 to 15 companies saying, okay, we no longer want to do business here in Louisiana. So we're going to drop those policies back in the pool, right? Uh, the good thing is some there are a few companies that stepped up and picked up policies that were dropped. Uh, our citizens, which is our last resort 
market uh, went from 36,000 policies at the middle of 2022 to 136,000 policies or so right now in uh, 2023, at August of 2023, where we are. So uh, that puts a very big strain on, on citizens. You guys, if you remember, we had that 63% rate increase, which is a statewide average um, that happened at the beginning of January 2023, which was approved in October of 2022. That 63% in some areas was 70, 85, 90%, 100% in some areas, depending on where you were, uh, because it's a statewide average, which means it averaged out to 63%, but it could have been minus somewhere in North Louisiana, plus four here, plus two there, which averaged out to 63%. All right. Right now, with the policy count, we're looking at probably another rate increase request for citizens, which will take effect at renewal time starting January 1. But I can't be sure of that just yet. Um, any questions about that part? Nope. OK, we'll move on a little bit. We'll talk about the incentive plan. So we got forty five million dollars to incentivize companies to come in. We had. Eight companies apply. We gave out 40, all 45 million to the companies. Um, they came in. This is the deal. It is not free money. So if anybody's telling you it's free money, it's not free money. There are hooks to this. They have to write uh, policies. They have to take most of their policies out of the go zone area, which are those 30 parishes that had uh, that were declared gubernatorial gl disaster areas. Um, most of those policies are going to be in citizens. Um, if they get losses during that time, we don't pay for it. It comes out of their pocket. All right. So uh, one of the things we're seeing is companies are really hesitant. As you guys all know, we're in the middle of hurricane season. We're about to hit the peak hurricane season. And I don't know about you, but if I was an insurance company, I wouldn't be writing me right now either. It's just, it's a business. Reinsurance markets have tightened up. They're not, they're, they're global markets. So if you guys see a loss in, um, hang on a second, my computer just, if you guys see a loss in, in Japan or some other area, Australian wildfires flooding in, in Europe, which is not a government, uh, not, they don't have a NFIP like we have. All those things are covered through private insurance and that's a part of a global worldwide market uh, and the reinsurance market. Reinsurance has tightened up quite a bit. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of pressure on the market. So where are we now? Uh, we're hoping, we gotta keep our fingers crossed and hoping that we can get more companies to come in. We're doing everything we can. I was in, matter of fact, I was in um, Seattle this week with a bunch of companies and I'm like, look, don't come here and write 50,000 policies. You over there come here and write 5,000. You over there come here and write 5,000. If I can get 10 companies to write 5,000 policies or 10,000 policies, I think we're in good shape. Uh, it's just getting them to come and do it. Right now, they're very leery of coming to, to Louisiana. It's it's a tough, tough market. And, um, you know, trying to get these carriers to come in and, and do business here. You know, again, it is a business. It's not government backed. One of the things I, I think some people wanted to hear was about any regional state's efforts. So this is our problem. Texas has a Texas wind pool, and they got a lot of money. We get hit four times more than Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, and Florida. Mississippi won't partner with us because it's a losing proposition for them. Alabama has six miles of coast. Florida, which has the largest coastline, they reinsured their whole market probably to the tune of $110 billion. 
Right now, they, they, they're they looking at about $98, 99000000000 billion worth of estimated losses from Ian in the second hurricane that hit them a little bit a little short while after. Um, their market is in flux and is in, in a worse position than all of this because they reinsured their market, which means the losses by the insurers were reinsured by Florida, the state of Florida. And by contrast, if you look at their budget, Florida's budget was $157 billion last year. Louisiana, 37. They have a lot of money. We don't. Um, it, it's it's it, it's really one of those things where we, we are trying to make sure that the market uh, is stable and then we start to see more companies coming in. Uh, the... Big thing is we had we got $30 million for Fortify. And what does that mean? We want to fortify these roofs. If you if the roof doesn't come off, the interior doesn't get wet, the clothing, the furniture, you don't have to be out of the house. That's what we want to do. We want to show the market that uh insurance is a good uh, Louisiana is a good place to do business because we have hardened our housing stock. We've made it better. So that insurer can come in and say, hey, um, look, we have good houses. And the commissioner made a very good point. When he went out to London last year, uh, earlier this year, excuse me, he said, look, you guys just paid for $28 billion worth of roofs in Louisiana. Why don't you come back and insure them? Because we know they're brand new. So that was about, I think that the number was almost 798 thousand properties damaged or destroyed so that 30 that 30 million dollars is a a great start to get people rules on the it's not income sensitive it's first come first serve we think we should be going live october 1 with uh and turn it on so people can apply for it to get in and it's going to be up to a ten thousand dollar grant not the difference between what it costs to put the roof and what it costs to do fortified, but what it cost the ten thousand dollars up to ten thousand dollars to put a fortified roof on. It has to go through certification. It has to be um, vetted. The house has to be in good shape in order to put a roof on. We have to have evaluators, and the whole process has to go through. The payment will not be to the homeowner. The payment is going to be directly to the contractor. The contractors are going to be on a list in in the Department of Insurance. Um, so when you go and do your application, you can go and choose three in your area and choose the best one for you. And that's how we're going to do that. Uh, we thought it'd be best for us to do it in house and and not send the payments to to the um, homeowners and to have independent evaluators to go out and make sure that these roofs are put on correctly to the Fortify standard. And every contractor has to be uh train through ibhs international institute for uh, business and home insurance and they they are very cognizant and conscious about what they do and what they put their name after any any questions so far let's see hey i'm assisting did you say how someone signs up for this or how someone can have access to it so that's going to go live on our website. So the best thing for people to do is go on and make sure they sign up to get the notifications from the Department of Insurance. And the, web, uh, the website is www.l, D as in dog, I as in ice cream, dot L, A as in apple, dot gov, G-O-V as in violin. Um, you go there, you sign up. There's going to, when, when someone wants to go in and sign up to get a fortified roof they go in and they do it all electronically all right so we can make sure that everything gets done again it's we 30 billion dollars is a lot of money but it's not a lot of money when you're trying to put on roofs <laughs> let's see yes the the roof it, it's it's a homestead exemption home you, you have to live in the property to get the money Um, so, you know, it, it's we, we the best way for us to to, to show that Louisiana is ready is to 
fortify these rules, making sure we are building in proper places, making sure we're cleaning up properties, making sure people are taking advantage of all of the incentive money and everything that's out there to make the to harden their properties. You as as real estate professionals, look, making you guys making sure that the houses and the people you're talking to, the people come to you to sell and the people come to you buy, making sure they're doing everything they're supposed to do, right? Um, one thing I, I, I caution you about is making sure if someone has a flood insurance policy and you're the seller, that that person keeps that flood insurance policy and just transfers it over to the new buyer. Because if not, they're going to get whatever the new rate is if they go and buy a new policy, right? It is a... It's imperative. I think you guys can use that as a selling tool. Hey, mm -hmm. the homeowner is willing to transfer that policy, that flood of policy to you for a price, for not a price, for whatever it is. So you're not, you're going to get, if there's going to be an increase, it's only going to be 18% per year, and you're not going to walk into a $10,000 uh, flood policy if, if that's where it's going to go to. So just make sure that you guys do that for me. Um, as when you're selling, Please, 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 please make sure your buyers and your buyers read the policy, not just the deck page. If the deck page is important, but policy language is the most important thing in that policy. That's the way they get paid. That's how they file a claim. That's what they have to do in order to get paid once they file a claim. Um, some of the important parts, you know, the, the dwelling. Read the exclusions first, please. Ask them to read the read the exclusions because it makes a difference. Uh, let's see what types of responses are you get from insurers you're trying to attract the tips. So, uh, really, I think there, I think companies. So there's a question that said, what types of response are you getting? What type of response are you getting from insurers uh, we're trying to attack, uh, attract? Right now insurers are pretty skittish about coming to Louisiana. I mean, when 50, 12 to 15 of them just walk away, that's a problem. And we are uh, cognizant of that. So I think they're gonna be really ready to dip their toe in. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we get out of this hurricane season unscathed or relatively unscathed, I hope. I close my eyes at night and I pray that we don't get hit by a major storm because that will cause so many more problems. And not just from it, the insurance standpoint, for, standpoint, from the mortgage, ins, the mortgage standpoint, because right now we have people literally who can't stay in their homes because their mortgage, their insurance costs are exceeding their mortgage costs. So it, it, it is very tough. Uh, does, yes, the website will will ask that there's a question that says, does the website indicate what documentation is required for the program? Yes, there. that's going to be there. It's on the site. You're going to have to provide that documentation. It's going to tell you everything you need to be a part of that incentive program. Let's see what other, other questions. Okay. The total policies are only good for as long as the policy has them. Meaning, is it meaning? Uh, so, Dina, Deanna, uh, the question is: You've been told policies are only as good, only good for a year. Uh, which which policies? It, it, okay. You you still on mute, huh? It's my understanding that let's just say you assume a policy and it has nine months left on it. That you can assume those nine months, but then at the end of that nine months, it's going to readjust to whatever the new price is going to be. But yes, you can assume it, but it's only got as much time left on it as the homeowner has for that year time frame. Yeah, it's but the what what we were being told by NFIP is if it's going to go up, it's only going to go up by eighteen percent, not the full amount. Okay, so it still it still can be. It can still go up, but just not a huge amount of they Yeah, yeah it's not going to go up 100%. It's, that's not the way it's supposed to work. That's what they told us. 
Okay, well, that was that was why I was questioning it because they were saying it's still going to go up. I only have two months left on this, and then it's going to you know go up, and yeah. we don't know how much, and you know, can I afford it? Yeah, you know, it's going to go up, but it's only going to go up eighteen percent. Okay, eighteen percent for the for five years until they get to whatever the rate is. Uh, let's see. The site is on right now. The, the question is, is the website on right now? Yes, the website is up, but you can't get any information for homeowners. This is right now, we're just signing up evaluators and contractors so we can have them ready when people are signing up. Uh, we won't go live with the, with the, the uh, active website for consumers until October. It should be October second for what i'm understanding I, i'm you know that's the date they're giving me but you know how it people are any other questions any other questions look thank you guys for having me uh, i think i might have gone over a little bit of my time um but i really appreciate you guys being attentive don't hesitate to ask questions um, my email address is ron.henderson at ldi.la.gov. And my phone number is 225-219-4775. Hey, Ron, can I ask you one more question? Sure. So when you were talking about these roofs, you can get money for replacement is, I mean, is that meaning on to subsidize the the insurance policy that you currently have, or is that if you have no insurance, how do you get how do you qualify for a roof subsidy? So the roof sub subsidy is just you you your house qualifies to put a new roof on, and the evaluators come out they make sure the structure is sound and you can put a new roof on the house that you live in. Um, then you will get a rate reduction on your insurance because they had to file, all insurance companies had to file a reduction for a fortified roof. It was mandatory. Okay. Um, there's one other question about the incentive. Is there any area that the companies who got the incentive don't have to write policies in? I know we had we had a targeted area, mm -hmm. but they can write the policies across the state as long as there's a certain percentage within yeah. what we formally call the go zone, basically the Gulf Coast. Yeah. Correct? So that the requirement, they can write anywhere in the state. The requirement is, is they had to write policies out of the go zone area, I think at least 50 percent, and they couldn't write more than 20 percent in any any parish unless they got unless they got a waiver from the commissioner anybody else got a question all right so it sounds like everybody needs to direct their customers to the ldi website get them to sign up for the notifications on the program and be ready to go october 2nd so all of our buyers and sellers can take advantage of that money first. Yeah, I'm, 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 we're authorized to do a couple of rounds if all the money is not taken up from what I understand. I don't foresee that being a problem. <laughs> I have a feeling it's going to be gone. Yeah, I, I, I do too. I do too. But I mean, again, thank you guys so much. If you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, if you have, um, you want us to do know your policies or come and talk to you because we are qualified to do C CE for real estate association. So we can come out to your other association. We've done quite a few in the Lake Charles area. Uh, so we, we're, we're available for that. We will go to homeowners association meetings. We will come to your church meetings. We want to get as much information out to the public as possible. Um, I, I feel that an educated public works much better because they know what questions to ask when when the when there's a problem, especially when you have an insurance company that's not treating them uh, fairly. And it looks like we have one more follow up on the incentive money. 
Sure. Can they refuse to write in certain zip codes if they got the money? Oh. When, when you have, when a company is refusing to write certain zero codes, it's used, it usually means they've hit that 20%. So yeah, they could say, yeah, we, we're not writing in this area. And I know right now of three companies that receive this incentive money that are not writing in Arlene's, Jefferson, St. Tammany, and Plaquemine. So, and St. Bernard, really, yeah. So yeah, they can. Is there anything we can do to go have that uh, twenty percent increased? Well, the company's got to come to us and say, "Okay, we want to increase." Okay. Right? If they come to us and say, "We got," then you know they have they're going to have to file a plan and go, "Okay, this is what we want to do, and this is why we want to do it." Um, I mean, if you guys have, have noticed, Commissioner Dolan is going to retire at the end of the, the session, at the end of the year. We're going to have a new, new commissioner coming in. Um, you know, we'll have fresh face and fresh ideas and we'll see what, where it goes from there. And Deborah, you have another question? Yes, I did. Uh, and with these fortified roofs, this the roof needs to, uh, has to need replacement. I, I'm taking it that if you've got a new roof, relatively young in the last year or two. That, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's just not going to work. Right? No, no, no. There's also a retrofitting that oh. you can do for a brand new roof. Okay. You had okay. to put on. Now you need, you want to retro. There's a retrofit. Okay. That you can do. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And the retrofit would also qualify for the grant dollars, Ron? Don't know. I'm going to ask that question. I, I think so. But I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. So I'll I'll shoot that answer to Kim, and she can get it out to you guys. All right, last chance, anybody. All right. Well, thank you, Ron. I know you have to run. You've got other meetings. We really appreciate you, and I'm sure some of the associations will be reaching out to LR to get you scheduled in front of a. Uh, their members and and the public in their area because we all love CE credit for one thing, but two, we need this information to get to the yes, consumers. So thank you again for giving us your time today. Thank you, Ms. Rhonda. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate you paying attention. Y'all have a good day. All thank right, you. and thank y'all for letting him go first. We're gonna uh, go back to the agenda and I know D is on here fresh off of a commission meeting and a forums meeting. So we're going to let her get started with updates on the changes. And I got some information from Summer on renewals. And in case y'all don't know, D Halfin, she serves on the Real Estate Commission. She was appointed for Supreme Court District 1. She was born and raised in Metairie. She went to UNO and started her real estate career while she was a student there. Um, she be, got her license in 1998 and started with Remax Real Estate Partners. And she's now part of the management team at Coldwell Banker Tech. So Dee, are you ready for us? I'm as ready as I can be after the last couple of days. <laughs> that was good information from Ron. That was awesome today. Um, several of my committee members that have spent some time with me this week are on this call. I think we made some great, great changes to our documents. We did the property disclosure last month and we did the purchase agreement yesterday. Lots and lots of suggestions, which was awesome. We love the input. I don't think we made any life changing where the world's going to come to an end when you see it. I do think that everyone would be pleasantly surprised by the fact that the formatting is going to flow. It's going to be lovely. It's going to be, everyone will be pleased with the finished product. It does come for review. We have, um, everything's being compiled as we speak. The property disclosure was brought before the committee yesterday. We're going to make some additional tweaks to it. 
the changes we made to the purchase agreement will be compiled and we will have them at the beginning of September. That will come before the actual commission in our September meeting to be approved. Once it's approved, we get it out to train the trainer and it will be mandatory as of January 1st. So I think you will be surprised, pleasantly surprised by the changes that are made. Any of my other committee members want to chime in that you were there with me? Share some insight? Ladies? Anna, you want to add something? I was there for the first one for the uh, for the property disclosure, but I was not able to make it for the buy sell agreement, D, because I was in Chicago. We had Prissy, we had Janice, we had Evelyn. I think we had some great representation on the committee to make these changes. So I think it was awesome. My happiest part was having one signature on page 10. <laughs> I have a quick question for you, Dee. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, every time we change these documents, that becomes part of the new um, mandated CE course for the following year. Has that topic been let out yet? No. Oops. <laughs> Getting a little behind her on that one, huh? No, we are, it is going to, we should, and that's why the urgency, I think, is to get it up and running and ready for train the trainer so that it can be our mandatory topic for January and make sure that everybody has. So in other words, you're talking about a four hour um, um, property disclosure and, and mandated a purchase agreement course. I think, I think it's going to be four pieces. I think it'll be four different modules in the four hour mandatory that we bring for next year. So I do, I appreciate that. I think the four different topic, topics make it a little easier for us to swallow sitting still for four hours. I know I struggle sitting still for four hours as I'm standing up talking to you right now. So yeah, so <laughs> it's, it's definitely going to be good, but I think we have that. Yeah. I do think education is key. Spreading the message, just like Ron said, spread the message about the insurance. We need to spread the message about the changes. Cindy, do you have your hand up for a reason, ma'am? Yeah, she is the chair of the education committee. I'm, I'm trying to get her to unmute. Come on, unmute, Cindy. I thought I was. Sorry about that. Knows. Okay, hi. Um, the four hours is two hours on the contract, one on property disclosure, and one hour on case studies, you know, relative to what's going on in our industry, all the, the stuff that's happening. So it should be an interesting four hours. That's awesome. Did everybody hear her? Two no. hours, two hours on the purchase agreement, one hour on the property disclosure, and the final fourth hour would be on case studies, actual things happening in our environment so that we can be a little bit better educated on how to handle some of these things. Thank you. Rhonda, are you going to handle these changes that we got and the updates on the renewal, or you want me to share that as well? You can go right ahead. The, you know, we changed when the renewal, license renewal, takes place last year. And I think we were all super concerned about how that was going to work out for us. <laughs> I can tell you that. As of this August 15th, we've had 4,000 of the licensees already renew online. That's impressive since we're only 15 days into this renewal period. We had, there will be two more renewal emails sent out in the upcoming weeks prior to the October 1st delinquency period. We'll continue to send out emails through December 31st. After December 31st, there is no grace period. You will not have a license. We will have to start this process all over again. But I can tell you one of the questions that we were asked was a recap from last year. How many people missed the grace period for their license expiring and not being able to renew? You ready? Because I'm impressed with this number. Six, only six. Uh -huh. Wow. Out of the thousands of licensees, only six people do not have a license after that renewal period last year. 
I think one of the biggest questions I get asked is when they go in and do their renewal is do they have to have all their CE done by their renewal? It's still December 31st. As long as you have it done by then. And sadly, I'm one of those people who is not finished for the year yet, but I will, I promise. I know, Rhonda. I know, I'm trying. Okay. There is, a, and again, the last one was, do they plan on extending the December 31st grace period this year? No, there will not be an extension after December 31st this year. There will be no grace after that. But I can tell you, Jeremy at the commission is one of the newest additions, I think, employees that we've had in the last year. He's been wonderful. He's done a lot of social media videos on Facebook and he's doing a lot of informational pieces that they're putting out there. So if you're not following the commission, please go on Facebook and like and follow us. He's putting out informational pieces that are tremendously helpful. And part of that is reminding people about the renewals and all those things that we have going on. And I would encourage all of y'all that are brokers or managers Go into the commission, check your list. You can see who's renewed, who hasn't renewed. You can check their education and say, hey, you still need your mandatory and here's where you can go get it. Or, hey, you're a broker and you got to have two mandatories this year. Um, I know our office starts early before renewals. About mid-year, we tell everybody where they're at on their education based on what's been reported. But if you start making that a practice ahead of the renewal period, you won't wind up with people who aren't licensed after December 31st. So that will help. Uh, does anybody have, well, there's a question about what was the purpose of the change? Uh, who wants to, which commissioner wants to answer that question why we renew early? I think one of the biggest reasons they made the change when they made it is because at the end of the year with the holidays and the transition from that end of the year and everything being renewing at the end of the year, this makes this cycle a whole lot easier for the commission to handle all of those renewals at this time of the year instead of at the end of the year. If I can interject, the main reason that they uh, have done this is in December 31st, if you do not renew your license, your E&O insurance will not cover that, that licensee for January. So they would extend people over and they would not be, be covered on insurance. And the next question is, this the year, is this year the end of an ethics cycle? And I, I should know this answer, but I believe it's not Evelyn. 2324. Yeah. So you still have time to get code of ethics. You can get it by doing C2EX. You can take the free class in NAR, or you can take it for continuing ed through any vendor that your association has deemed that class acceptable for code of ethics. I would advise you if you're not taking it from your association, you're taking it somewhere else. Be sure and send that copy to your association office so they can report it through the M1 system to NAR so you don't get dinged that way as not having completed that. You can take it in September too at the meeting in Shreveport. That is true too because we have a Marquis class which is an ethics class and meets right. code of ethics too. standards and it's all about the code of ethics and AI. So That'll help you with two items that you need to know a lot about. And Kim is putting that schedule up right now. So that first class from nine to noon on the 19th meets the code of ethics. And it also helps you with your artificial intelligence that we all are starting to use a lot. Anybody have any more commission questions? Any commissioners have anything they wanted to share with the broker? Yes, yes. I had put a question in the chat box. Oh, I'm this sorry, Deborah. Deborah. I missed you. Go ahead. Deborah Pounds again. Um, you said something about E&O insurance not covering January. I'm trying to, I thought those all expired at 
uh, December 31st. But when you renewed the your license, license and, and the ENO insurance December previously. 31. Yes. So there's still a gap in January? Not yeah. if you renew your license. I'm sorry? When you renew your license, that's why we made it to the deadline at the end of December. People had delay of renewing their license. And in January, when their license was renewed, when you renew your license, you pay your ENO insurance. So they did not, they were not covered in January 1 because they did not renew and pay that insurance. It created a gap in their policy. If that's they didn't renew by December 31st, it created a gap in their well, policy, which means nothing's covered. Right. But then that means you also, well, anyway, my questions have, have a direct, bearing on this. If I am penalized for not renewing my license by the end of August, and I decide after that, say for instance, not to renew, or I decide to go, I'm wondering, am I spending money for a renewal and I can't get it back? The you know, answer a lot of to that is yes. I've already looked into it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, 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 you know, I never understood why this was happening, especially so many months in advance when people are still contemplating what they're going to do, especially in this market. Well, and so because of the gap, it is exactly because of what they're saying, because if you didn't renew by the end of December and you were still practicing and for some reason you missed one credit hour or something like that, and your license wasn't active, but I mean, wasn't really active because you didn't complete your education, but yet you were still selling real estate you wouldn't be covered. So they right, backed it up to ensure anyway, that you would be covered prior to the end of the year. Well, how many people actually fall into that category? You know, for to make it two months before the end of the year. Well, you'd be surprised people that that, that happens and to. And I'm thinking know. that that's people who are just not taking care of their business. I'm talking about people who are planning to renew and keep their license in effect they're gonna to see to it that they renew, but before the end of the year. Um, and I'm talking about people who are contemplating. Uh, this is uh, August 30th, September, October, November. September, October, November. It's the end of August. It gets delinquent, right? Or is it the Deborah, end of August? there's a couple of things, couple of things uh, that, that you can consider here. One, if you've practiced real estate this year and you think you may have a problem, then you're going to want to carry E&O insurance, even if you retire for another year. You can check with Rice or whoever your carrier is, and they have discounted policies. Now, if you go ahead and renew and then decide to get out, the Real Estate Commission will not refund any of your $70, or if you're a broker, you know, whatever your broker's fee is. But you can get a refund on your E and O. However, you probably want to hang on to it so that if you uh, have any uh, uh, any issues that come up after you're retired on anything that's happened in the last year or so, you you've got some coverage. Yeah, and yeah. and that makes perfect sense. As a matter of fact, I had not even thought about that, but I wouldn't have a problem extending my E and O coverage. It still does not address the fact that we are being required to renew three months in advance of expiration of your license. And that's well, all I, I really was, I was struggling with that, trying to figure out why three months. I mean, anybody who is taking care of their business are going to, for the most part, there may, may be some oversight, but most of us who are going to renew for the following year, we make sure we meet that deadline. Right, but previously and there was a grace period months. through there was a grace period through the end of March. Those people did not have any E and O insurance, and they were still renewing in March, paying late fees, which is now October, November, December for late fees. And they didn't have a trailing E and O policy, which created an issue for anything they did this year. Okay. So backing it up, you're not charged a late fee until October. You can still have to the end of the year to make your decision. You're just going to pay the late fee that people were paying in January, February, and March prior to this change. So you can wait and make your decision. You're just going to pay a little bit more. You know, I, I, I'll accept that, but I don't agree with it because the people who are paying penalties in January 
have, they did not renew in time. But my license is good till December 31st. And oh, I should be able to. I can to, tell you is, yeah. this was heavily debated. The legislature <laughs> even chimed in on it. So I'm not sure who your state representative is, but that's where you can go complain now because it is, it's in statute that this is our renewal period. Oh yeah, I, I know that. I just, it didn't make sense to me. It still doesn't, but I got to go with it and live with it. I'm not going right. to take it in. So first. make sure all your people renew before the end of the year. They don't have a problem. Not likely. Thank you. <laughs> they may have a problem, but it won't be with their license. All Deborah, right, it's, a seven, it's a $70 risk. Um, yeah. So make up your mind two months early. People will blow Starbucks. I mean, they'll blow 70 bucks at Starbucks or at the adult beverage store. Well, again, you know, that's $70. I don't mind paying the $70. That in itself is not a problem, but it shouldn't be. I shouldn't be penalized before my license expires, period. But I'm going to live with it. I guess you'll just have to disagree with the commission because we all live under the same rules. Next up is Kristen Oglesby with BSW. I am not going to say Brazil Saxe Wilson, even though I just said it. Um, she is with our LR's attorney of record. Kristen is an associate there prior to, go, prior to going into private practice. She served as a judicial law clerk to the Honorable S. Kyle Duncan in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Um, she is an LSU Law Center grad and received her undergraduate degree from LSU as well. She is going to cover hot topics from the broker hotline through August and or July and give us some tips on reducing risk with broker supervision of licensees in the areas of the commission conversation we better be having with our buyers and sellers, approving advertising and team oversight, because those were the most fined areas if you read the Real Estate Commission quarterly newsletter that came out. So Kristen, are you there and ready to take this over? Hey, Rhonda. Yes. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, as you said, I work with BSW. We advise um, LR on a, a number of matters and we also run the hotline. So I'm going to start with just a couple of the, we've been doing the hotline for about two years now, a couple of the topics that we see over and over again. Um, and those are the commission inquiries, deposit related inquiries, and then everyone's favorite related to leases, which are the emotional support animals. And I I feel like I have to touch on that just because I get one of those a month, it seems like. Um, so our, our biggest commission inquiry has been actually it's one related to commercial um, real estate, not residential, and those are on the commission liens. They're um, the commission lien. So there's a privilege in favor of brokers who are selling any commercial real estate that's related to either the sale, lease, or any other conveyance of the property. At least five days prior to the transaction for you to exercise that privilege, you need to do two things. You need to file a notice of your lien, but you also need to send notice to the purchaser that you have this, this lien and that you're going to exercise it should you not receive your commission. Um, the lien lasts for one year after close. And then again, it doesn't apply to residential transactions. So it's just for the benefit of the commercial transactions. Um, there is no standard form for filing your lien, but in years past, the, the attorneys that have worked on the hotline have suggested language and that's available online. I actually found it this morning um, in the, le the last legal hotline year and review packet that was promulgated. We'll have another one coming soon, but if you look at the most recent one, you can see um, a standard form that we recommend to file your lien. So that's it on the commercial liens. The second is the deposit inquiries. And so we get a lot of questions on when things go south, how to deal with, if you're holding the deposit, um, what, how to deal with that. 
So there are a couple of rules and regulations in the LREC rules and regs that apply. Um, first and foremost, anytime that you get knowledge that there's a dispute that things have gone south, you need to send written notice to all parties involved in the transaction. So that's your buyer, your seller, and then the, the counter licensee. Um, everybody needs to be aware that there's an issue going on. And then you kind of are on, on a clock as well. So if you get, you know, if you... Um, get notice from your client that the transaction's going south, the 60 day clock starts ticking. And within 60 days, you've got to do something with that deposit. You just can't hold it indefinitely. So you kind of have four options. Um, option one is all parties come together and agree this, this transaction is dissolved. So we're going to send the deposit back and that's the end of it. Um, you also can just wait until you get a court order. That's probably not going to happen within 60 days, although it might. Um, if it's if you're in a really sticky situation, you kind of want to, you know, drop drop a bomb on everybody and say, I'm out. You can just deposit the money with the court and initiate what's called a concursus proceeding. What you do is you go to court and you say, look, I've got this hundred thousand dollars. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. Party X, party Y, and party Z are disputing who who's entitled to it. Court, please figure it out. So you kind of remove yourself from the situation. Um, it is a little more of an extreme option, but it's definitely there, especially if you cannot get the parties to agree how the deposit needs to be dispersed. The fourth option, and this one um, definitely lends itself to a little, I don't want to say exposure for you, but it kind of puts you, you know, you're, you're leading the charge as the person holding the deposit. Um, you can disperse the funds upon a reasonable interpretation of the contract that authorizes the, you as the broker to hold the funds. So under the purchase and sale agreement, it says that if the buyer um, elects to terminate during the due diligence period, the deposit is returned, the contract is canceled. So you read that purchase and sale agreement and say, okay, buyer, you you know, you, you, you canceled for whatever reason or for no reason. Um, here, you know, you get your money back. That I don't know in practice how often that's done. I think the best practice would be to try to resolve something before the parties and get assigned writing. Just that provides more coverage to you as the person holding the funds in escrow. Um, but in the event that you do decide, if you don't have written written authorization from all the parties and you don't want to go the court route, you do just want to say, look, I've read the purchase and sale agreement. Buyer gets the deposit back. Um, you have to send written notice to both the part all are not both all parties so that includes buyer seller and then all the licensees that are involved in the transaction and that written notice has to be sent at least 10 days before you disperse the funds um, so you just want to make sure that when you're dealing with these deposits that you're paying attention to your time periods you're always communicating in writing um, you know we recommend that you know more if you have a conversation with somebody memorialize it in writing just to cover yourself and then the last topic we see in the hotline, um, everybody's, I think, favorite is um, in the lease situation, the emotional support and the service animals. And I just, I want to, I'm going to briefly address this. There, there is tons of literature. You can really get down in the weeds on this. But if you are representing um, a landlord who comes to you and says, I don't want any pets, um, I don't want a certain type of breed, you, that you can't, that's, the law does not permit that to be a blanket statement. So the service, there are two types of animals. You've got the service animals and the emotional support animals. The service animals are regulated by the Americans Disabilities Act and the Fair Housing Act regulates emotional support animals. Service animals are only dogs um, that have been you know, trained pursuant to a whole host of guidelines. If somebody comes to your, if you have a client who's landlord and says, I have a service animal, your client is very limited in how, how the landlord can respond. You can only ask two questions. It's, is it a service animal? Yes or no. And if the answer is yes, then you can ask, what does it do? And if it says this, this service animal calms my anxiety, that's the end of the inquiry. Regardless of what the service animal does, you have no right to inquire um, any further. If it's an emotional support animal, you have a little more flexibility. You can ask for, quote, reliable documentation that the animal is a support animal. Now, reliable documentation can include a letter from any, any type of physician or NP, PA, any healthcare provider that says, 
you know, John Doe needs this animal for X, Y, and Z. Once you have that documentation, there's nothing else you can do with that either. So you're really limited. Um, we just urge um, extra caution, especially in the instance with the service animals, because the law is very, very clear you, about the two questions that can be asked. Um, you don't you don't want to get into a situation where you're violating ADA. You also don't want to violate um, fair housing. You know, that's regulated by HUD. That gets you into a sticky situation as well. But there's a little more flexibility. You know, emotional support animals are a much newer concepts. So there's a lot of flexibility um, with those, those types of animals. I will note that the service animals, um, you can't, for both animals, you can charge a pet fee. Um, you can't limit the breeds, anything like that. But with the service animals, it applies to any area. You know, you can take a service animal into a grocery store. You can bring it to a hotel, any type of leased property. So even if it's a single family dwelling um, for the emotional support animals, the rule does not apply to private clubs or um, an owner occupied building with four or fewer units. So, you know, your multifamily building, yes, but if you've just got somebody who's got um, a triplex, that's not, they're not going to be subject to the fair housing rules and you don't have to permit an emotional support animal. Um, you also, if it's a single family house that's rented without the services of a real estate broker, you don't fall under the, the fair housing emotional support animal guys. So I think that that really wouldn't apply to anyone here because if you're assisting a client, um, then they are using real estate services. So with that, um, those are kind of the three hotline um, questions we get a lot. We also get a whole myriad of other random questions. We appreciate those. We try our best to answer them. Um, I will say we can't answer specific questions. So if you've got a contract that says, you know, you're 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 in a contract dispute with um, Joe Blow, we can't we can't advise on that. But any general questions you have about, hey, what do you think about this provision in a lease or this provision and whatever, um, we're happy to look at those and we welcome those through the hotline. So with so that, I'm going to switch over. Say it's a, it can only be before a dog. we leave the hotline, we've got some questions. Deanna, you have a question first. Yeah. Do you only? You said it can only be a, a dog. What did you For, say? That's um, a service animal. No. Uh, yeah, service animal can only be a dog. An emotional okay. support animal can be any animal. That's how they're defined. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So in the chat, we have. Did you say you can't charge a fee? Do you mean a pet deposit or is it a different fee? That's correct. So you can charge no fee related to the animal for either a service animal or an emotional support animal. So there can't be a pet fee, a pet deposit, nothing of that nature related to the presence of the animal on the premises. Okay, and then can a renter have more than one support animal? So that is kind of loosey-goosey. Um, we have seen literature that says you can have two. That's not codified anywhere. I think that there is room, there's room to challenge that. But because it's been tolerated, we would recommend if, you know, on the fly, I would say yes. Otherwise, I would say, you know, facts and circumstances. If it's something very egregious and you've got someone with five animals who says these are all my support animals, um, you may want to consult legal advice and try to push back on that. But yes, we do see more than one tolerated. All right. If it is an emotional support animal and you manage over three units, then you don't have to allow pets. I think it's if it's under three, three or less, correct? It's, it's it's under four. So yes, it's, or no, it's four or less. So if there are three units that are all part of the same building, then you don't have to. But if you've got five units and this, and if you've got a house that's divided into five separate units, then you do have to comply. All right. And then somebody asked where they could find literature. Kim's put a document in the chat. And then can an owner refuse to lease to someone with an emotional support or service animal? That um, that would indicate violations related to both the ADA and the fair housing, which prohibit discrimination based on the presence of those animals. Unless, well, service animal, 
I think applies everywhere, but if it's a support, if it's, if it's a support and you're exempt from, from the, the, if you're one of the three types of properties that are exempt, then yes, you could refuse. But if you're otherwise required to comply with the fair housing rules on the support animals, then no, you could not refuse. We have one question going back to the deposit. What about title companies holding the deposit? Um, I guess they're asking about disbursement <laughs> issues when the title company holds. So it's my understanding that that is not the, the title companies are not right, subject to the same LREC rules and regulations that you as the holding broker are. There's a I think on the purchase and sale agreement, there's a whole um, section that says if it's a third party holding it, different rules apply. So you are not the, the rules that I just stated would not apply to how to get, you know, what to do in the time frames and whatnot. And okay. Rhonda, 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 this is Norman. I will tell you, I spoke to the Baton Rouge Title Association several months ago and brought this issue up. And the sentiment in the room was that the, really the title companies do not want to be involved for the most part, a uh, show of hands, of getting involved really with holding escrow funds in their deposit accounts. That was just a sentiment. Um, and it, as you say, the rules don't apply to them as they do to a licensee through the Real Estate Commission. So um, some do, and it's fine if the clients agree to that, um, obviously for a title company to hold those funds, but the sentiment in Baton Rouge was at least, they didn't want to really get involved with having that other burden on top of them of holding the deposit funds. Okay, I think we answered this question, but can an owner agent refuse to lease to someone with an emotional support if they're in a duplex, which is a two unit, so they could fall under the exemption for emotional support, correct? Yes, that's correct. And then... Can you decline them for other reasons, for example, credit score, or rental history? I mean, that I think that would apply regardless of whether they have an animal or not. That's correct. An animal does not automatically mean that you're entitled to lease. Now, you do open yourself up, you know, just as kind of a, a, a watch out for, you do open yourself up to somebody coming back and saying, well, no, you actually did decline me because you didn't want an animal present on the premises. So just make sure that you've done your due diligence and you have your, you know, you've got your paperwork and your backup to show, no, it was actually because of X, Y, and Z, not because of the animal. And someone asks, what if they've already collected a non-refundable pet deposit and now they're learning they shouldn't have collected a, a pet deposit? So what should they you, do if you learn after the fact that it was a service animal or an emotional support animal, I am not familiar with that situation. I would advise that you refund the deposit, but that's just based on my reaction, having read these rules and regulations. Um, if nobody is complaining at right now, this is the time to just, you know, um, make the person whole so that you don't open yourself up for liability down the line. I think the people and who have know. these emotional support animals, they already know you can't charge a deposit. They're, yeah, most people will that. come in and say, hey, oh, I've yeah. got a service animal or an ESA. That's I'm right. not paying the, the, the fee. That's right. Unless they, they get their dog or whatever dog certified after the fact, you know, I, I mean, would you have to give it back then? Maybe um, that would be the only question, but otherwise they're going to know. Right. And then I'm going to assume that in our hotline summaries or in the one that's about to be published, there's someone's asking for some language that can be used when refusing to lease if the owner agent is a duplex or a fourplex or below. Do we have that somewhere or Kim, can, can we put that? So we don't that. have any, I have not, we have not drafted any language in a, I guess, in a rejection or refusal notice that says this is why that you're not leasing the property, but we certainly have the citations to the exemptions that say that if you're one of these three premises, you don't have to comply. We can provide those sites. They are in the hotline responses that have been generated. They're in the hotline review. And so I would reference those citations when you're um, giving an explanation for why. We can okay. get a deal to um, compile some of those as one standalone article if, because um, it sounds like y'all have a lot of questions about that and, and need it. And you do. So um, we'll talk to Kristen and Eric about that after the call. 
There's a request to repeat those exemptions one more time before we leave this topic. Okay, so the fair housing does not apply to number one, owner occupied buildings with four or fewer units. Number two, a single family house that's rented without the services of a real estate broker. Number three, hotels, motels, and private clubs. So in the leasing aspect, it would just be an owner-occupied building with four or fewer units and then the single family house that's rented without the use of um, a real estate broker. And Kristen, you want to clarify um, if that's for emotional support animals or service animals or better? That is only for emotional support animals. There are no exemptions for service animals at all. All right, everybody got that? We're good. So let's go to risk management. Okay, so a couple of the topics that we're going to hit um, pretty briefly are just supervision about the commission conversations, advertising, and then team oversight. Um, so in the LREC rules and regulations as a broker, you have the responsibility, you know, related to supervision, to record keeping, and to compensation. Part of that supervision responsibility is that, you know, one, you provide your licensees with a written list of activities that are permitted under the license law. And then you also need to have written policies and procedures to ensure that your licensees are maintaining an active license, that they're following all the advertising and the team rules, and that they're doing adequate record keeping in the event that LREC wants to come in and do an audit. Um, I can't emphasize this enough, putting everything in writing, having your written policies and procedures, having those written policies readily available is the most important thing. Um, I, if you have an oral conversation with anybody that you're supervising, it's best if it's, you know, related to one of your functions as a supervisor, it's best to memorialize it in writing just to cover yourself. So transitioning into um, the supervision of licensees regarding commissions. So as you know, the listing broker and the client agree on the commission rate for the sale. It is very, very important that the client is aware um, when, when you're negotiating that commission of the service levels, the cost tolerance, what the market is doing, and then also your client's preference is heard. It is absolutely not proper to ever, you know, to tell a client that, well, we're going to set the commission at X because that's just what we do. Um, the NAR code of ethics requires that you place priority on the client's best interest and telling your client, we're going to do this because this is how it's always been done, runs afoul of that obligation. Um, it's also important to let your client know that this is something that can be negotiated and that kind of ties hand in hand with not saying this is what we're doing because we're always, we've always done this. Um, it's also important, and this is an LREC rule, that if the buyer broker compensation is going to be a closing cost of the seller, it's got to be disclosed in the written offer and it's got to be accepted by the seller. You've also got to specify in writing the amount that's going to be paid. So again, emphasizing notice, writing, um, full disclosure from the beginning. And as long as you're doing that, you should you should be complying with both the LREC rules and your obligations under the code of ethics. So I know that was short, but um, do y'all have any questions on the, the supervision regarding the commission conversations? And if not, um, Rhonda, do we have any? I have a question. Oh. Wait, go I, ahead, Deanna. Deanna. So I've seen a thing now where um, the brokers are asking the attorneys to cut their checks directly to the agents instead of running it through the brokerage. <laughs> Is that legal or does it matter? I mean, I don't. Um, well, that's I don't. something we would have to research off the top of my head. I that doesn't sound like that's proper. Right. Um, but I, but I, I mean, I've not seen that situation, so I can't give you a definite answer now, but if you want to run that through the hotline, we'd be happy to research and generate a response that we can. It was, up. um, it's, it happened on a, on a transaction. It was not mine. Uh, but one of the agents came to me and said, is this right? They had the, the attorney wrote the check. So it didn't run through the company. The attorney wrote the check for the broker. And I was like, I don't, I don't, uh, that scares me. Yeah, that that um, I would be weary of that. 
Okay. Well, I thought that was B A D. Uh, yeah, I don't think the commissions changed the rule on that. Uh, that's what I said. I said you can't be paid by anybody other than the broker. They said, well, the broker gave them permission to disperse. I said, no, I don't think that's how that works. Anyway, I, I didn't know if y'all had seen that. That was becoming a trend or uh, just the new scam. <laughs> That's Somebody asked, how do we access the hotline? Kim, do you want to put that web address up? Thank you. Go to larealtors.org, like always, and then search for a legal hotline or do a forward slash legal dash hotline. Again, BSW is, is not going to answer a specifically for your case because they are not your direct attorney. They will give you general guidance that... Um, you should always consult your own attorney for your given situation. All right, Tony, are you through, Kristen? I'm sorry. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, if, we have, if there are no other questions, I was gonna jump into advertising. Oh yeah, I forgot we had that topic on there. <laughs> I'll be quick, I know everybody's ready to move on. Um, Okay, so approving advertising um, pursuant to one of the LREC rules, you've got to provide written notice to all of your sponsored licensees about compliance with advertising. Um, there's a great flow chart on the LR website that, that details um, what you need to do, but I and it, it almost tracks verbatim and order the LREC rules on advertising. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'm just going to hit the high points. Um, you've got to use all reasonable means to make sure that all of your licensees are complying. Um, this does, these rules do apply to all forms of advertising. So, you know, written print, internet, social media posts, oral advertising, business cards, um, nothing is exempt. Any way you're soliciting any type of business, it's regulated. Um, as a broker, all the licensees advertising does have to be approved by you. The buck stops with you. So your um your familiarity with these rules and regulations is very important. So with that, the, the few rules and regulations are um, the advertisement's got to have your name, you as the broker's name and phone number in an identifiable manner. And you cannot put it if it's, you know, on a white piece of paper, you can't put it in super light gray in the corner. It's got to be readily identified. Um, it's brokerage gotta, name, right? It's brokerage name, not broker. Correct. Brokerage name. Yes. Um, it's got to be the brokerage name that is registered with LREC, no nicknames. Um, you've got to have written authorization from the property owner before you advertise any property for lease for sale or for any type of other conveyance. If the licensee owns any interest in the property, that has to be disclosed on, in a readily identifiable manner on all of the advertising. So if um, John Doe is the licensed agent who's advertising this property. It's got to say John Doe, comma, owner and licensed agent or something to that effect. It is very important to verify um, the accuracy about the property, the terms, values, um, any, any licensee interest in the property. And if the advertisement is for residential property, it's got to include the month and the year of the advertisement. That does not apply to commercial property, only residential property. And then last, if the brokerage is a franchise organization, you've got to state that the brokerage is independently owned and operated. Um, specific to internet advertising, every, this is, every page of the website and then the first and last page of any emails, posts, et cetera, have to have the brokerage's registered name, the city and state of the main office, and then the jurisdiction where the license is held. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're posting on social media. I feel like it's pretty easy to, to stray from strict compliance with that, but it is important. And Kristen, I don't know how to raise my hand anymore, so I'm trying to figure that out. But I do want to add that um, the advertising, social internet advertising uh, rules were developed way before like Snapchat and TikTok and everything. And um, it's something that uh, we've spoken with Summer Mayor, um, the executive director, about a need to maybe, and she agreed that we need to clean those up in the near future because they have not 
um, prove to uh, move with the times and might not be able to, but um, so just letting y'all know that that discussion has taken place. Thanks, Ken. There's a question that says if the licensee lists the property with the agency, then owner agent does not have to be in the advertising, but it does have to be in the contract. Is that correct? That, yes, that is correct. Any more questions for Kristen? All right, now we can go to Tony. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks, Rhonda. Tony. Unmute. You're up. You got to unmute. I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And I want to say thank you to all the brokers that are on the call today. Thank you. Um, so I want to go over the fall conference and riding with the brand. We've already gone over some of the things. Um, it'll be uh, held in Bossier City. It'll be on the 19th and the 20th. Um, the course, the first day, we'll have a course there building an uh, ethical, all-driven real estate industry. Uh, and that is presented by Mark E. Lemons Rao. This course, as they talked about, will meet uh, the requirements for your triennial seventh um, training cycle from January 1, 22 to December 31st, 24. So after that class, grab some lunch and we'll take a shuttle ride um, across the river to Shreveport. Um, that is for the NAR's Riding with the Brand event and at the Shreveport Convention Center. Riding with the Brand is an NAR's nationwide tour to celebrate realtors, cele celebrate us in every state, the work realtors do every day for our clients and value that we bring to the communities in Louisiana. This event is free to all realtors. Uh, we do ask that you register for this event so we can get a headcount. This event will bring an inspiring message to NAR leaders touring riding with the brand, the tour bus, and unveiling of uh, Get Into Home. Louisiana presents a snapshot on home ownership opportunity in Louisiana. This is a study where thousands of you recently answered survey questions about the residential market in Louisiana, as uh, me and Rhonda and Cindy joined in together and did the same thing. So. And then we have a grand finale, a dozen candidates running for statewide office, uh, office of governor, uh, office of lieutenant governor, secretary of state, a treasurer, and the commission of insurance. I think we found out yesterday the commission of insurance will be um, somebody dropped out, so we only have one Republican. Is that correct, Rhonda? Yes, 10 people will be the commissioner of insurance. And as far as I know, he's still going to be there. So y'all can hit him up with all your insurance questions on what he's going to do to address our, our big dilemma. So, um, and then uh, we have a showstopper of a, this, with riding with the brand finale. This will be followed up with a reception. And I know we all like receptions. Um, celebrating the 2023 Louisiana Realtors Leadership Class and a YPN social and a LARPAC major investor appreciation wine and bourbon tasting. So that sounds uh, that sounds like fun. Actually, that dinner goes along with that bourbon tasting. In day two, the following day, we'll begin with a two-hour CE uh, entitled uh, "Running with the Business: Running with Your Business and Changing Markets" with uh, Mara Neal. The afternoon will consist of government meetings and then the main event the parties of all parties to hit uh, North Louisiana. Can't wait. So your installation of your 2024 realtor, in a, uh, Louisiana Realtors president, Cindy Dyer. So congratulations to Cindy Dyer. So she's going to be a great president. The next thing I'd like to talk about is uh, member benefits. And we have gone across the state to talk about member benefits. And we'll, we will go to any part of the state that um, you guys feel the need. Talking about Office Depot, uh, as a member of Louisiana Realtors, you have an exclusive uh, access to UPS flat rate pricing and savings of 50% on domestic next day deferred, 30% on ground commercial, commercial 
and up to 50% additional services. Uh, the members can also take advantage of uh, UPS Smart Pickup for free. And I, I also we talk, I was going to talk about Office Depot. With this, you'll receive a savings up to 75% of the best value list of preferred products with free next business day delivery or in-store in curbside pickup. To, consent, to continue to receive your member, uh, member, member discounts, you will need to re-enroll or register with an account through our dedicated ODP site. So if you've already registered, you may need to register again. You can go to louisianarealtors.org forward slash member benefits and sign up for these two great programs and more. Kim signed up for it last night, so she said it was pretty easy to do. So please go to the website or call the office if you have some questions, call me and we'll, we'll get you to the right spot. I hope you guys are enjoying these meetings. And I guess, um, you know, on our next, our next quarterly meeting will be December 6th. We're looking for some new topics that would benefit to help each and every one of your brokers. So if you have some things that you'd like us to cover, then send those to Rhonda. Um, or myself or Norman or anybody in the staff. And we will do our best to get great speakers to, um, to answer any questions that we might have. So that's all I have, Rhonda. All right. Norman, do you have anything you need to add? No, uh, um, I'll, just, I'll say this, reiterate, there was a Kim put in the chat box, um, a question that Kelly Decody had. NAR will start requiring all realtors in 2025 to complete a two hour fair housing course in conjunction with the quadrennial requirements every three years in order to keep your membership in the realtor organization. So starting in 2025, you'll need to complete the code of ethics over a three year period, as well as the two hour fair housing course, which can be uh, offered any state courses or national courses or courses that NAR offers through their website, Fairhaven, uh, DEI training, et cetera, will be um, approved. So just wanna make you aware of that. We're gonna continue to promote that because it's not here yet, but it'll be here before we know it. Um, thanks to all the brokers for your support. We're, we're here for you to help you become even more successful in what you do. And I know your agents are a big part of that. So we wanna support them in any way we can to make them more productive when they're working with clients and customers. And the last topic that is going to probably be amping up more and more, and you've heard a little bit about it as it relates to some of the lawsuits with the National Association of Realtors on the class action suits dealing with the commission payments and the buyers, uh, you know, the issues that, that, that the suits uh, seek to address. Um, NAR, uh, along with other states now, and Louisiana is not excluded from this, is encouraging all buyer brokers agents to use a buyer brokerage form. Um, several states are looking at legislation to mandate it. Others are looking at highly recommending it to the brokerage community for their agents. Uh, Brazil is researching that now, and we're going to try to come out with a template of a buyer's broker's agent by the end of the year. We hope that we can circulate around and, and, and stay tuned because we've got to get with our leadership and, 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 the, and, and the leaders to be to discuss this. Because certainly an avenue to address this is go to the legislature like we did on the buy-sell agreement, as well as the property condition disclosure and make that a mandatory document. Um, but we're not there yet. And we want to make sure we do the right thing for our state and the brokerage community on that. So those are a couple of topics I just wanted to give you a, a primer on that we are looking at, studying, and are on top of, and we'll continue to do the right thing for the members in the state on that issue as well. Norman, there's a question on the fair housing. Is it two hours or two and a half hours? It's two hours um, uh, required by the National Association of Realtors. When did they change that? That was at the board of directors meeting. I want to say this last one, Evelyn. Yes. It's <laughs> not it. a half of the pain <laughs> in the can. And Norman, and I have, um, uh, we just, I got this email from NAR for, um, other purposes, but it's a, that Word document goes through everything, rationales and everything that will um, be required and why. And I'm also informed that NAR will be developing a um, one of these courses for commercial practitioners too. Did it used to be a three hour course or was it always two and a half? Two and a half. So yeah, it was three. I thought it was yeah. three. 
And that was why I was wondering why they were only offering it in a two or two and a half when you needed another half or something. Um, hey, quick question. The night for the leadership graduation, is that is that only for the class that's graduating or who is invited to that? We're, we're going to announce we're going to announce the at the Riding with the Brand event at the reception, the, the newest class. But mm -hmm. we want all the classes there, too, uh, in, in part of that whole day. And we certainly um, will we'll be announcing all the classes in the past to step forward and be recognized as well. At the I mean, Riding with the Brand event. Uh, OK, so, so anybody who goes to Riding with the Brand can go to the leadership graduation reception. That's what I'm asking. Okay. Yeah, that's all included at the end of riding with the brand. We're going to recognize everybody at that reception. Okay. So we're just wearing our blue shirts that have riding with the band, uh, with the brand and patch on the side. Is that what we're doing? That's correct. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And there's an order form on the website if you need to get that shirt still. Um, I will be mailing them out if you order it before September 1st. We'll send it to you so you have it to pack in your luggage. David, was your question um related to mandating the buyer agency agreement form yes um i'll answer that david we're not sure yet what we haven't got to the point in the road where we're absolutely certain it's necessary to do that it, it may be necessary to draw up a template of one to have that provided to the brokerage community to consider implementing on a volunteer basis and certainly they can change that form but I envision if it if it did go to the legislature, uh, any mandate would be similar to the probably the, uh, the residential agreement where it would be easily changed by brokers um, in terms of being able to manipulate and add things that they thought were different in their market. We certainly don't want to tie any one brokerage firm with one set of words or language within any document. So we're looking at it, studying it and hopefully have a decision later in this year, whether we need to pursue it, either option A, as I mentioned, or option B. Answered Carolyn's question. Yes, code of the two and a half hours for code of ethics is different from fair housing. You have to have both starting with the next cycle. All right, anybody else have any questions or anything you wanna add? Carolyn, you need to unmute. No, I'm good. That's all. I, I just I know it was two different things, but I want to make sure the hours, because uh, usually we do three hours on code of ethics. Nobody does a two hour, two and a half hour class. So I just thought maybe they would drop that, you know, two and two. Thanks. I have a feeling they'll go up, not down. <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> All right, if nobody else has anything, I will hopefully see you all in Bozier for the fall meeting and riding with the brand events and installation. And if not, hopefully you'll be back on December the 6th. Uh, we'll just have bring your own cocktail hour because it is that season to celebrate. And hopefully we'll have a, another good set of topics to go over with you all. Please, please, please. Send your topics, your questions you want answered. That helps when we put the agenda together. Y'all have a good one and we'll see you soon.